Today we are joined by Mr John Murray, the Managing Director of Perennial Value and the Portfolio Manager of the Perennial Value Australian Shares Trust. John, as the founder of Perennial Value, can you tell us a little bit about the company you established in 2000? Yes, well it seems like a long time ago now, doesn't it? A lot's happened um, uh, over, over that period. Um, good markets and poor markets and everything else in between. But uh, no, we started off in 2000, uh, Tim, and uh, we started off in a, in a rather humble fashion. Um, we started off with about $40 million in, in funds under management, and you know, pleasingly that's uh, grown over time. Um, but um, we wanted to be a long term investor, uh, as the name implies, perennial value, a value investor. Um, my background prior to that was value investing and felt very strongly about value investing and we'll talk more about that over the, over the next few minutes. Um, I think it works well uh, for investors over the long term. Um, we built a diverse client base, uh, Tim, over that period of time. Uh, we have a lot of mum and dad investors investing with us, both directly and via financial advisors and via larger financial institutions as well. So we've got uh, institutional investors as well, Tim, big fund managers, uh, or sorry, big super fund uh, managers as well. So we've got a diverse range of clients, which I think is a good thing for the business to have a, a diverse range of um, uh, clients as well. So that's it in, in summary. Um, so, you know, and going forward, we, we want to be around for a long time. I mean, one of the things that I look at a lot um, in terms of the business as opposed to the investing side is to, uh, you know, we're constantly thinking about what we need to do inside the business to build an enduring business that's perennial value and that will be around for a, a long period to, uh, to come. You know, a lot of that revolves around uh, um, bringing good people through, particularly in the management, uh, investment management team. And we spend a lot of time thinking about that as well. So uh, it's a um, it, it, it's it's a it's a it's, it's a great thing to be involved in a business like this. I I, I love what I do. Um, I've always loved what I do. Continue to love it. And uh, yeah, we're pretty exciting. Uh, pretty excited about the future going uh, going forward. John, I'd like to spend a little bit of time now on the research process behind Perennial Value, with a particular reference to the Perennial Value Australian Shares Trust. Can you explain to us what the investment objectives are of the trust and what is the investable universe? Quite straightforward. We're looking to outperform the, um, the stock market over time and the way we look at that is the A6300 accumulation index. So we're looking to outperform that by 300 basis points per annum um, over rolling three-year periods. Um, and it's been interesting to look at the, the shares trust, Tim, now for you know now over a decade and a half. If you look at the uh, performance there, it's been in excess of 300 basis points or 3% per annum over, uh, over a greater than 15 year period. So we'd like to think that we've achieved those objectives over the longer term. In terms of the investable universe, um, we invest in a, a mixture of large cap stocks and, and, and mid cap stocks. Of course, we have, we have another discipline here, perennial value smaller companies. Uh, so they tend to trawl in the smaller company area of the market. We don't go down below uh, much more than the market cap of about a billion. Um, so that gives us, as I said, a nice mixture of uh, large caps and mid cap stocks as well in the uh, portfolio. John, your strategy focuses on value. Can you tell us a little bit about the investment philosophy behind your process? Um, so as a value investor, um, we're, we're looking for good companies which are cheap. That, that's simplistically what we're, what we're looking to do, um, which intuitively kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Um, and not much point buying. Um, good companies are expensive. Um, there's not much point buying bad companies, of course, um, regardless of their valuation. So we're looking for good companies that are cheap. That means that we're typically looking for stocks that temporarily can be out of favour. Um, we're a moderate value investor. Um, now, I mentioned that term uh, as opposed to a deep value investor. A, a deep value investor tends to look for very, very cheap stocks. Um, but the problem with that style of investing is that those stocks can often go broke. Um, we're not that style of investor. We're looking for good companies that are temporarily out of favour and are cheap. And we believe the value added that comes from that is that if our research is on the mark in terms of our in-depth company research um, and we buy for good value, um, then those stocks will ultimately be re-rated over time. As other investors see that they're good businesses at the end of the day and that they're a bit too cheap um, relative to their earnings prospects, Final point to make on that, uh, Tim, which is very much key to our style as well, is um, 
we often use the term internally margin margin of safety. Uh, margin of safety is a really important part to value investing, and it comes in two aspects, uh, which in a sense I've already related to. Um, the first one is is buying value, um, buying stocks which are which are cheaper than the overall market. But the second part relates to quality of stocks. Um, we spend a lot of time looking at balance sheet structures cash flows and profit and loss statements of companies. Um, we don't like highly geared companies. Uh, we prefer companies with low debt levels. So the margin for safety is kind of twofold. It's first of all in the valuation, looking for good value stocks, and secondly, in the structure of the balance sheets, i.e. Uh, looking for companies that don't have high debt levels. In terms of process, how do you select stocks for the portfolio? Okay, so in terms of constructing a value portfolio, there's, there's, there's really two parts to that. What we're, what we're doing is combining in-depth company research with a disciplined valuation framework. And just to quickly summarise both of them, the in-depth company research, that comes from the 15-person team, which we have inside perennial value. So we spend a lot of time looking at balance sheet structures, um, market positioning, the quality of management, um, previous track record in terms of delivering profits and so forth. So there's a lot that goes in that. And, and just on that, one of the key things there is we do a lot of company visits. We spend a lot of time out of our offices uh, looking at uh, looking at companies, kicking the tyres. Um, uh, so that, that's the in-depth company research. Um, then we get to the valuation framework. So, so that bit determines, Tim, whether or not we believe a company is kind of like a, a good company or a bad company. And then the second part, once we've determined that it's a good company, it's a, if it's a bad company, then we don't do any more research, regardless of valuation. If it's a good company, we've then got to determine whether or not it's good value or not. And that's where that, that stock ranking or valuation framework comes in. A couple of points to make there. We rank stocks in a range of measures. Um, some of the measures we use, um, uh, price to earnings, price to free cash flow, uh, dividend yields, and when we look at dividend yields, Tim, we also add in franking credits as well. So in other words, we rank stocks on what we call gross yield or pre-tax yield. Um, we love our yield and we love our franking credits. Um, we also look at price to NTA. Now, NTA, of course, stands for net tangible assets. Um, that's a bit old-fashioned, but we do find from time to time we can unearth some really interesting opportunities on a price to NTA basis. So there are a range of valuation factors we look at there. And what we do there in terms of the actual valuation framework, we have this um, screen, Tim, called the perennial value screen, uh, stock ranking model, which uh, and, and we rank well over 200 stocks. Um, and what that does is it ranks the stocks based on those valuation measures um, I've talked about um, from one uh, down, to, down to the lowest ranked stock. And that therefore becomes the driving force behind the portfolio structure. So in other words, what you'd expect falling out of all that um, is a portfolio um, which is predominated by, by better value stocks and obviously better quality businesses. So it's quite disciplined in that sense. And the way it works is that um, we'll go into a stock that's good value um, um, and, and is a good business. Um, and then over time, uh, as the share price rises, uh, we'll, we'll be taking profits in that stock um, and ultimately, if it becomes too expensive, we sell out of the stock. Um, and then what we do is that we reinvest in the next good value opportunity. Um, so it's a very disciplined process, a lot of numbers involved in it um, that, 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 that determines at the end of the day the, the end structure of the portfolio. You manage a concentrated portfolio of between 20 to 70 stocks. How do you manage concentration risk within the portfolio? Well, within that 20 to 70 stocks, Tim, we typically over time have had about 40 to 45 stocks in the portfolio. And we find that works quite well because one of the key parts to delivering on our, on our objective and in line with the fact that we are a moderate value investor is that we want to deliver a consistent outcomes for our investors over time. You know, we don't want returns jumping up and down. And so if you have too few stocks in a portfolio, that can deliver really volatile returns. But if you have too many stocks in the portfolio, then you're not backing your best ideas, as it were, in terms of our disciplined stock research process. So that's why we've found around about 40 stocks um, seems to work uh, over the longer term. Now, within that 40 stocks, that brings some benefits as well. Um, it brings um, benefits in terms of diversification. And the diversification really comes in two ways. The first way it comes to him is that that gives us diversification across different sectors um, in the Australian economy. And just on that, interestingly, what it also does these days in contrast to an Australian shares portfolio, say, 20 years ago, 
it also brings geographic diversification offshore as well. And we know there are many, many Australian companies now, compared to, say, 20 years ago, that have significant operations overseas. So you get nice overseas diversification these days in an Australian shares portfolio. The other area of diversification lies in the market cap or the size of companies. Um, um, so so, so we, I think I mentioned earlier that um, we invest in you know, larger companies, you know, big top 20 companies, if we see that there's good value there. We also go right down and delve into the mid caps, down to a market cap of around about a billion dollars as well. So we achieve quite a bit of diversification there um, within our portfolio. Uh, and so that's the way we think about portfolio construction, uh, concentration, risk, delivering consistent outcomes and, uh, and so forth. John, as part of your process, how do you avoid value traps? This whole issue of value traps is very uh, relevant to us as a value investor. I, I, um, you know, I mentioned that, uh, earlier that we're a moderate value investor in term, rather than a deep value investor. And a, and, a, and a deep value investor is someone who, who invests in really out of favour stocks. Um, but often the reason they're really out of favour is they're about to go broke. And that's why it's important that we have the in-depth research that we undertake inside the team um, at, at here at Perennial Value. Um, but having said that, there are there are times when we when we do look for companies that are that are really out of favour and their share prices are really really cheap. Um, you know, we owe it to our investors to look at those companies. The key way in avoiding the value trap there is, um, and it gets back to my uh, my uh, focus that I mentioned earlier about margin for safety. So we know there's margin for safety in terms of that a stock might be cheap, but the really important bit here is to determine whether this is fundamentally a good business or a bad business. Um, that's the key part. So, and the balance sheet is often really critical to that. Often when companies end up in trouble, and I've seen this so many times over so many years, it often revolves, Tim, around too much debt. Uh, we just don't like companies with a lot of debt. So hence um, the importance of the numbers background that we have within a lot of um, our team members and our, if you like, unabiding focus on, on balance sheet strength. And obviously what comes with that is an analysis of the company's cash flows and also their profit and loss as well. So we look at a lot of ratios, uh, Tim, around that area, uh, net debt to equity, net debt to NTA, which is net debt to net tangible assets, net interest cover, um, off balance sheet liabilities in terms of operating leases, it all gets pretty complex. But we uh, we spend a lot of time look, looking at the financial accounts. So, uh, and if there's any, we do, the final thing we do is sensitivity analysis. That's really important with regard to cyclical stocks. Now, with cyclical stocks, we know that their earnings, by definition, can move around an awful lot, and that's often where the value traps are. So, one of the things we do there is we say to ourselves. Okay, what's the worst case scenario for a cyclical stock? A resource stock could be a good example of this. So a couple of years ago, we might have said to ourselves, when, when the iron ore price um, and coal prices were much higher, looking at, say, BHP, at that point when those prices were much higher, how does BHP look? We know how it looks if, if the commodity prices keep going up. It looks fantastic. But what happens to BHP's earnings, balance sheet and cash flow if we factor in an iron ore price and a coal price that goes back to the long-term average, which in a sense is what hap what's happened over the last couple of years. So we do a lot of sensitivity analysis around there. So in other words, again, that margin for safety keeps coming through and looking at a worst-case scenario there. So the short answer is if we, see, if we see under that scenario analysis that a company could go broke, then no matter how cheap it may appear, we just won't go there. But one of the things I'm really proud of um, is uh, in the life of perennial value, I've never held a stock in a portfolio that, that, that's gone broke. Um, so you know, I'd like to think that, uh, that our research process works in terms of avoiding those, uh, those value traps, but it's something we need to be very wary of just because we are a value investor. John, what sort of investor does the fund suit and what's the recommended time frame for investment? Yeah. I've always felt that this fund uh, is very much a, a, um, a fund for all seasons in, in a sense. I, think, I really do think it suits a whole range of investors. In fact, when I, when I look at the, the type of investors in the fund, there are all sorts of investors, Tim. There are, there are people in the sort of the early stages of accumulation, people in their 20s or 30s, um, people in their sort of middle age, sort of 40 to 50, and then as people are sort of moving on into their 60s and 70s, we have a lot of investors there as well, um, a lot of SMS investors in, in, in the portfolio. And I think as we're, as, as we're ageing too, 
investors' time frames in terms of the amount of time they should stay in the stock market has become longer as well. So in a sense, I think the fund's becoming more relevant with the ageing demographic as well. Um, you know, we pay a distribution. Um, that's not our major focus. Another one of our capabilities as shares for income trust is a there's a much stronger focus on, on distributions there, year in and year out. But nonetheless, I do know that a lot of investors that invest in this fund invest because of the, uh, the regular distributions, half yearly. Interestingly, in the over 15 years which we've been uh, managing the fund, uh, we've never failed to pay a half yearly distribution. So I think we've got a, you know, a sort of a reassuring track record there as well. So I think in a nutshell, it's suited to a wide range of investors, Tim. Why are Australian shares such an important component of an investor's portfolio? Yeah, th th this really goes to the whole hub and reason as to why, you know, why Australian shares. It really does. It, you know, if you sort of take away all the headlines and all the discussions we all have on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of the Australian share market and global share markets and macro events and what's happening, you sort of strip that all away. At, at the end of the day. Um, the key reason for investing in the Australian share market is that over time the Australian share market has been proven to be a very good source of growing investors' wealth over and above the rate of inflation. And I know in the many conversations I have um, with investors, and indeed myself and many members of our team are investors in our own funds as well, but all of us are investors in the Australian share market. Um, we're looking to outpace the rate of inflation over time. That, that's, that's fundamentally what we're looking to do, even though we might forget that from time to time. Uh, and, you know, that's whether we're, we're starting off with $10,000, you know, $100,000 or a million dollars. So we're outpacing the rate of inflation. So then look at the Australian share market and you say to yourself, well, how does it do that over time? Fundamentally, the way it happens, and, and this is very much um, dear to the way we invest, as we've discussed in the Australian share market as a value investor, in investing in good businesses should outperform the rate of inflation over time. And the way that works is as follows. Good businesses should grow their profits over time. And, and the great news there is that as, as, as profits grow over time, there's two outcomes there that, that deliver what we call this total return outcome from shares. First of all, as profits grow, dividends grow. And, and of course, there's an enhancement in the Australian share market because of our imputation credit regime. So pre-tax um, um, outcomes are better um, with, with, with the dividend growth and imputation credits. Um, but secondly, as profits grow, then over time, share prices should, should grow over the longer term. And that's what we're, we're looking to do when we invest in the Australian share market, as we've discussed. Look for those companies that grow their profits over the time. Don't go broke. So strong balance sheets. And you get that combination of that dividend growth and that share price growth over time. That's a really, really powerful combination, really powerful combination. In fact, there are many examples, um, and CBA comes to mind, um, uh, many examples of, of Australian companies where the dividend growth alone, plus the franking credits, has outpaced the rate of inflation. But then you overlay the share price growth on top of that. It's a very powerful formula for outperforming the rate of inflation. So that's fundamentally the key reason, I think, why we're fundamentally all engaged in and invested in the Australian stock market. And, and that's why I think our value style at perennial value, I think it's very powerful in terms of um, enabling investors to achieve that outcome of outpacing inflation over the longer term.